Hello, Blind Man Bert here, and I want to talk a little bit about graphic user interface design. Now, typically, uh, graphic user interfaces can only really be designed by programmers in most in most um, programs that exist today, um, for the simple reason that it's fairly complicated uh, to write code that displays something. Uh, could be a a series of graphic shapes or perhaps a scientific visualization of some kind of data. Um, it tends to be ver a very kind of code-like environment to display to display these things. You're often working in JavaScript or or some kind of procedural programming language, um, uh, Java, C, C++, Python, and um, these are fairly daunting languages to learn. And another uh, problem is that you tend to be working kind of an indirectly. You're not directly working with graphics. You're not pushing around shapes on the screen. You're pushing around code that generates those shapes. So you're kind of working a level indirected from what you're seeing, and that's a bit of a problem. There's one graphic user interface designer who's started influencing my thinking very heavily over the last few years, a couple of years, and his name is Brett Victor. He's been most associated with um, Apple uh, in designing uh, kind of advanced theoretical or research-based uh, user interfaces. But a lot of these user interface designs find their way into such products as the operating system itself. Uh, from, from OS X Lion on, many of Brett Victor's ideas are key core ideas to the uh, user interfaces. And in fact, in this talk, uh, I'm posting uh, after this introduction, I'm posting three Brett Victor talks in this playlist starting with inventing on principle in which case in which he in 2012 showcased a design environment which was uh, way ahead of its time and many of the uh, aspects of this are what we now today know is Xcode 6's playground interface where you can basically be writing code here that's generating graphic stuff and you can actually be seeing how the code executes in in real time. Now, what he invented in or di or disp or disclosed in 2012 is way goes way 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 beyond what the playground interface actually does. Uh, it's really a, a very powerful paradigm for uh, writing code based on the kind of the right brain way we think of things, which is objects and colors and lines and so on in a conceptual framework as opposed to the indirect approach of having to program in, in um, a, a, a particularly gnarly language like this is this happens to be JavaScript. So I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'm going to let him describe that. And certainly if you want to skip ahead um, and just watch the Brett Victor videos, please feel free to do that. But I want to say that Brett Victor is not the only person who thinks this way. Um, I am very fond of a package called GeoGebra, which is, um, it's hard to explain what GeoGebra is, except that the name itself is kind of a melding of geometry and algebra. So GeoGebra is a way of representing geometrical things while still allowing the power of algebra to describe what is going on. In algebra, we can define very complex mathematical relationships, which happen to have geometric components. But what you're really doing, and you'll see this when we talk about the interface, is uh, you're really thinking in those conceptual geometric terms. You can delve down into the algebra if you'd like. I happen to be very algebra-oriented. I happen to be very oriented towards analytic geometry more than geometry. Um, so for me, it's actually a, a seamless thing to think in terms of algebra. But it turns out you, you don't have to think in algebraic terms. You can turn that off if it confuses you, and we, we can see how we can do that. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a, a kind of a demonstration of what GeoGebra can do in a moment. But I encourage you to go on to GeoGebra.org, download the Windows, Mac, or Linux version, get it installed, play with it. I guarantee you it will kind of change the way you kind of think about math. And in particular, if you ever have to design like an interactive presentation in which you're showing what happens when you vary a certain parameter and how that affects something geometric or mathematical, this will save you hours of coding. In e I mean, there's even things like Mathematica computable, uh, computable document format, which is, which is still, to this day, way, way more complicated than GeoGebra's 
approach. Make sure you download GeoGebra 5 or better. Um, it is uh, it, it presents a, th a 3D view, which is which is very uh, unique, and you want to kind of play with that. And I'll also post a link to where you can get the most up-to-date versions of GeoGebra, which are typically released um, every few days or sometimes once a week. Um, so the most current version as of today is GeoGebra 5063, and I'm using the more advanced experimental Java 7 based version. Um, another thing to note is on Mac computers they don't tend to always have Java enabled so you might want to go into your uh, system preferences and locate uh, if you don't see the Java control panel it means Java is not installed you're going to want to install that from Apple go on to um, support.apple.com get the latest Java install and then uh, make sure it's installed and make sure it's most up to date as of today, Java 8, Update 31, is most current. There are also some security considerations you need to uh, take into account. Uh, these are my preferred um, security levels. If you're concerned about security, you would want to go to very high and turn off Java content in the browser, um, or just simply uninstall Java altogether. But GeoGebra requires Java that uh, be installed. Ha, huh, boy, I went and got very left-brained there, even though I said I wouldn't. So um, let's actually do a quick demo of what GeoGebra can do. And I'm actually going to then pose a problem that we're going to try and solve in GeoGebra. So when we launch GeoGebra, we see that it comes up with this kind of uh, window that has like an algebra side and a graphics side and several tools up here and a whole bunch of menus up here. I'm going to do just a, I'm not going to do a very comprehensive view of what GeoGebra is all about. That, that comes about when you um, play with it quite a bit. But I will say that the perspective that you launch into is very important and initially you might want to launch into the simplest perspective which is geometry. When we do this we see the graphics pane takes over, and we, it's just like having just a single sheet of paper on it on which there will be graphics elements. And the algebra view, although it's still there, we can go up into view and enable it, it's being hidden. So this is really nice because we don't need to be distracted by all the kind of the, the codey things that are going to happen as we build things. What things can we build? Well, each one of these is going to let us build a different class of things. This uh, tool here, there's a variant of it, um, is mostly involved with moving things around. This is involved in um, creating points, creating points that are attached to objects, constrained by the position of the object, create points that are constrained to be intersections of two lines or a line with a plane or something like that, points that are constrained to be the midpoint or a center of an object, complex numbers and so on. And uh, here we have lines, segments, rays, uh, line segments that are constrained to be of a fixed length and so on. Uh, here we have various line or oriented things. So if we have let's say a line and a point we can define a perpendicular line to that first line which passes through the point or we have parallel lines and so on. And I should point out that this geometric view here is a two-dimensional geometric view. Separately there's a three-dimensional view which we're going to get into in a second. Uh, that's part of what was added in GeoGebra 5 but we're not going to talk about that right away because it's a little more complicated. We have various ways of creating polygons and regular polygons, ir both irregular and regular polygons. We have various ways of working with circles, arcs, sectors. We have more complicated conic section, uh, quadratic shapes such as ellipses, hyperbolas, parabolas, or general conic sections defined by five points. And um, we also have various ways of working with angles, distances, areas, and so on. And it goes, it goes on from here. Um, one of the important things that we're really going to need is a way of getting a value in, like a slider. I'm going to use that to kind of simulate getting data off of some device. Like some, We want to imagine that this is going to be used to visualize some kind of incoming signal. So I'm going to get back to what a slider is in a second. But let me show you what you can do. You can kind of define points this way. You just go to the point tool. And now I've created, you know, two points. Three points, sorry, A, B, and C. If we go into the algebra side of things, we can see these actually have, you know, numeric positions. If I go back to the move tool, I can take any of these points and move it around. When they're blue, that means they're totally unconstrained and I can move them. 
okay? There's no constraint saying where A or B or C can be. I could put them wherever I want. I can even stack them on top of one another. No problem. Let's say I wanted now to define, let's turn off the algebra view. Um, let's say I wanted to define a line going between A and B, but not, uh, not involving C, okay? So I just simply say I want a line, and I want it to pass between this. And now you can see if I click anywhere here, it's going to be constrained to go through A, but, the, but it'll create another unconstrained point here unless I constrain the other end to go through B. And you saw it kind of snap to that. Now, A is, the line is constrained. I can't move, uh, oh, I can move it, I'm sorry. Right, because A and B are unconstrained. So I can move the line around, and then it drags the points around because it knows the points need to stay attached. Or I can move the points around, and then that redefines where the line goes. Okay, but it gets better. We can define even more complicated things that go on there. Suppose my goal is to have, uh, what I want to do is I want to have A and B be somehow parametrically controlled by some kind of in input data, okay? And uh, that's coming off of some device. So these things might be actually bouncing around really quickly in time, uh, but not so quickly that you can't see it. I mean, I'm talking about like, you know, like maybe a, uh, you know, after a second or two, you can see where it's, where it's moved to. Um, but what we want to have is we want to have a circle, which is always centered at this C point here, that, that is tangent to this line. Wherever A and B go, okay, I want to have that circle grow and shrink uh, based on where A and B go. So how do I do that? Well, if you know geometry a little bit, you know that we need, we need a little perpendicular. Uh, a tangent is always perpendicular to the line between the center of the circle and the tangent point. We don't, ha we don't know where the tangent point is, but we can start by creating a perpendicular line. The perpendicular line needs two things. It needs a line and a point. If we say this line and this point, I'm not going to click, then uh, clearly the line is always going to be perpendicular at A. If I were to click here, and I haven't clicked yet, I haven't committed yet, it would be here. If I clicked here, then actually the point is not constrained, and we have a new point that can move up and down. But it, but for the purposes of what I want to do is I want to constrain it so that it snaps to or is associated with point C. So now we see something interesting, because now we have a line defined, which um, depends on all three points, the positions of all three points. So the parameter or the way that uh, that line gets defined, that line is called line B. That's this one right here. And we can change graphic properties, like we could make it dotted or whatever. Uh, we can make it thicker. Um, we can make it uh, we can make it red. <laughs> you know, you can you can explore uh, the graphics capabilities of this program quite a bit, but I don't want to de delve into that. I want to delve more into the concepts of what's going on. Um, we can see up here we have the kind of the equation for what's going on here defined. Now it's not really the equation because it's simply pulling in point data and coming up with these new numbers. So we don't. If we had to actually translate this into code, we'd still have to do a little bit of algebra to figure out how that line is defined. But it's defined, it's using those three, in, those three points as in inputs, and there's various constraints. This line has to be collinear with A and B. Uh, we have to have this other line be perpendicular, and that's in fact controlled by something called the construction protocol. This is really, if we say view construction protocol, we'll, we'll expose this panel. This is really the program that is being built up that defines these things. So let's actually leave that construction protocol up and now we'll see how the the program is actually building up more complex things. The last thing we want to do is we want to define a circle that is centered here that passes through this point here. But we haven't we haven't made a point there and we have to actually do that by going up here into the point tool and saying we want the intersection tool. We're going to def define a point D which satisfies both of these constraints. It is, uh, the point is always on line A and line B. The point is the place where those two lines meet. So you see how it's created a point D, and this tells you, uh, this tells you two things. This tells you 
not only how it's defined conceptually, but it's also showing the value. I can I'm having a little trouble making this bigger. Yeah, there we go. Uh, let me let me uh, move things around a little bit. Let me make my graphic view a little bit smaller. And there we go. That's that's way better. Um, so here's kind of like the definitions being built up. Uh, the constraint system. Here are the values which depend on where a and b and c are. All right. Um, but now we have uh, now we have the um, uh, here is kind of like the program being built up, and it's being built up in a geometric sense, although it translates to algebra. Algebra ultimately. Um, and f the last thing we have to do is create the circle which is centered at point C going through point D and now we notice if we you know if we I'm, I'm back in move mode uh, there's one problem with GeoGebra in that if you're in a tool you'll stick in that tool and you'll tend to want to go here and move this but what you're actually doing is now drawing a new circle so that uh, early on that really throws you off until you realize you have to constantly manually click to get back into move mode and I would like to propose or, or put into the source code tree a, a modification. The source code, uh, it's open, this whole program is open source. You can download the Java code that defines all of this. Um, what I would like to do, is, and I haven't had time to do this yet, is to post up a modification so that when you click on one of these tools, it's kind of like clicking but not committing to it. When you, do, when you complete that one operation, it always snaps back to move mode or whatever you were in before. Um, and it's only when you double click on a tool that you actually stick in that tool. I think that would actually be a significant improvement because I, I find myself constantly forgetting that it's modal. You, you have modes up here and that's that's generally kind of frowned on to have something that's completely modal without you realizing it. Um, so here's my thing. There's my finished program. But there's now kind of like a whole lot of extraneous stuff that we don't need to see. So I can either right click on this and say don't show that or I can find it over here, like I don't need to see this line, and just turn off the visibility thing here. We want all four points to be, well, we don't really need to see D. D. Oh, there's something important about D is you see how it's painted differently? That I can't move it because it's, it's, it's constrained by too many things to allow me to move it. Um, but I could, I could define something like, let's say there's a line segment going from the center here to a point on the circle. I can define things that are partially constrained. So you see how this is somewhere kind of halfway between being blue and black? Blue would mean it's fully unconstrained. I can move it around. Black or gray means it's, it's completely constrained. I can't move it. Here there's a partial constraint. So I can move it around, but I am constrained to it lying on the circle um, and being centered here. So uh, let's delete this thing. Um, oh, and we'll also delete the point. Oops, I didn't delete the point. There we go. Um, so we can see there's some, some rather sophisticated stuff going on. And lastly, I don't need to see the um, labels for any of these points. All of these objects, if I go in and go into Object Properties, um, will have various properties I can turn off. So I could turn the label off for that one thing and then go over here and turn the label off for that other thing. But an easier thing to do is just simply right click over here and say turn off the label that way. Or if in your object properties it's very consistent you just have to um, select the group of things turn off the label. We don't need to see the labels of the lines. We don't need to see the label of the conic section, the circle. So now we have, oh, and the other thing is we don't really need to see this point. So we can actually turn off that point. So now we can see in most simple terms the thing we're trying to define. We have a point coming in here, a point coming in here, a point coming in here, and behind the scenes there's a line, oops, that's the wrong line, there's a line here which is implicit that the circle is always tangent to. So for whatever reason, that, that's the desired thing we want. Now remember I said that I want these things to be controlled by parameters coming in. Well, let's do that next. I'm going to close this and create a new view. 
That's actually something I forgot. When you uh, close the last window in uh, GeoGebra, you're actually shutting down GeoGebra. So uh, that's that's something I uh, I tend to forget uh, happens. So let's start out as we did before in the geometry view. But I'm going to do things a little bit differently. For one thing, I want to show coordinate axis this axes this time around. So I'm going to turn on a layout feature where instead of having just a blank piece of paper, we're going to go in here, and there's all kinds of stuff you can turn on in here. But in the second option, the graphics options, you see we have axes and axes option here. So we're going to, we're going to move the axes here, and I'm actually going to kind of reposition my view so that the axes are kind of the way we normally think of them. So here's the x-axis, and here there's a y-axis. Now I'm going to simulate two data values coming in from hardware. And I'll tell you, what this fellow is, de is developing may involve monitoring hundreds or even thousands of parameters coming in in real time from various types of equipment, uh, more than one type of, more than one piece of equipment, and um, allowing those parameters to be presented in, a, in an intuitive fashion for the user. Now what I mean by intuitive doesn't mean, oh, we figured out this great way of viewing it, it means, no, it's really up to the user to decide how he or she wants to display that information. So that's that's kind of the key of why we're really defining a, a user interface that the user can control as opposed to a predefined user interface that we have decided this is the best way to view these 500 parameters coming in or whatever. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define two values, A and B. Um, these are The A value is going to vary from, from let's say, 0 to 12 would be good. On, uh, no, let's say 0 to... Yeah, actually 0 to 12 would be good in this view. And we're going to have B vary from 0 to 10, just because it's what fits on the screen right now. And those are going to define where our points A and B lie. Okay, So the first parameter is A. And let me just put the slider over here, let's say. And it's going to be called A, and it's going to vary from 0 to 12, I said. And we want it to be a horizontal slider. And we can change the size, we can change various things about it. If we want, we could give it, a, it we could define whether it's a number, a real number, an angle, an integer, and so on. Um, so here's our parameter A. We don't have anything attached to it yet, but that's fine. Next, we want to have B, and we want to have B kind of defined over here. So I'm going to, I'm still in slider mode. I'm going to click down here this time, and define a B that varies from 0 to, to 10. And this time is vertical. There's our B. Perfect. That worked out really well, because the it's, it's perfect. Now, we want to have, instead of having A and B be unconstrained points as they were the last time. We want to have them be constrained to lie. In the case of A, we want to start from the origin and we want to have it be A units extending to the right. That's our line segment. The next thing we have to do, and now that we have these sliders defined, is we actually need a point defined here at the origin. Um, the way I'm going to do that is it knows about what the x-axis and the y-axis axes are. So I'm actually going to create a point which is at defined to be the intersection of these two axes. Okay. Um, if I go into the object inspector, we see that uh, A is defined to be the intersection of X axis and Y axis, and that's exactly what we want, but it's a little inconvenient to call it A. We'd rather be calling it O, for obviously reasons, since it's the, the origin. We could have also done this by right-clicking on it, and there's a rename tool there, but I wanted to show you that it really was defined as the origin. Furthermore, as we saw before, because this point is constrained in that way, I can't move it. It's the origin, and it's always going to stay the origin. Now we want to define a line segment that uh, starts at the origin and moves A units to the right. Now A, the slider right now, you see is 0. So let's get it off of 0 uh, here, because otherwise something very bad would happen. Um, let's just say it's going to be at 5. We'll make this one 5 as well. Um, what we now do is we go up and we select it, not line, not line segment, which would connect two points. Both of these connects two points. We want segment with GIF and length. 
So to use this, uh, that jitter that you saw was me just uh, accidentally hitting the, uh, the scroll wheel on the mouse. Um, what we want to do is we want to click on the center point and now it's asking me how long do you want to make this? Five. And you notice it, uh, it constrained it. I don't know exactly how it decides to do the x-axis. Uh, but yeah, it constrained it to be that wide. So if we go back and we change this, that's, that's now being correctly defined. There's a line, and let's make the line, um, let's make the line bigger so we can see it. Um, and let's also get rid of its name. Yeah, we can make it bigger here by changing this thickness. So there's the line being defined. Okay. Now, I don't know if this is going to... Oh, it's not constrained. Yeah, that point is not constrained to being uh, on the line. It's actually, uh, it's actually semi... It's a semi-constrained point because it's exactly A away. But that's not what I want. What I want is... I want it to be intersect. Oh, it's a point on a circle. That's the way it got defined. Hmm. Oh, yes, I know what I'm doing wrong here. And this is um, my, my concept for how I'm doing this is wrong. What I want to do is not define a line. I want to define a point. Yeah, I want to define a point, which is a units away. And the way I do that is first just build a point here on the x-axis and build a point here on the y-axis. Now we're going to go in and fix how they're defined. So let's go into the object inspector now for A and look at how it's defined. Right now it's defined just as a point on the x-axis. But what we can do is we can give it the coordinates um, no, this is not going to work. A comma zero. No, this is not going to work because this is going to, or maybe it is. Oh, it is. It is working. Yeah, it is actually constrained to the x axis. And if I move A, you see it's affecting the slider. And if I move the slider, that moves A. So that's exactly what we want. It goes all the way up to 12, and it goes down to 0. Yeah, I don't tend to use sliders. So I tend to, this is something actually a little bit new for me, but I'm glad that it's, we're seeing how it works here. OK, so now we can similarly redefine B so that instead of it's, it being defined as any point on the x-axis, we say that's 0, comma B. And that's going to be um, moving up and down. And we don't need, yeah, let's leave the label in place for now because we'll turn those all off later. So there's B, okay? B goes up and down this way. So now we just basically finish the construction that we had before, which is we define a line between A and B. Now we need another point because I don't want the circle to always be at the origin. I want the circle to be able to roll up and down wherever it is. Perhaps that's another uh, the point is here is being controlled by another input parameter. So C, let's say, initially starts out over here. Or we'll put it right there. C, okay. Now I need the perpendicular line that is, perpen that is perpendicular to this line and passes through C, okay. We don't need to see the labels for the lines. So let's go into one of these and turn off... We can basically say, let's select all the lines and turn off their labels. Perfect. Now we need an intersection point here. And that is uh, a constrained point. You see, I can't move it around. Okay, uh, But it does depend on, as A and B move up and down, that changes. Okay, And over here, we now finish with the circle starting at C, being tangent and intersecting at D. And now all we have to do is clean up a number of these uh, labeling things and so on. We don't need to see 
the label of the circle, but we do want to see the circle. We don't need to see either of the lines. Um, these numbers here, we don't need to see their labels either. That controls whether or not all this tagging is going on. We don't need to see that, but we do need to see those number inputs, those slider inputs. Um, and then for the points, we don't need to see the origin. We don't need to see this point. We do need to see the other two, po three points, but we don't need labels for any of the points. So let's turn off labeling. And that should be it. There you go. So there's our kind of, oh, and the other thing we don't, yeah, let's leave the axes on for now. Um, so this is basically our final kind of, this is, the, this, this is the final output that we've got from what is essentially a program. Um, if we wanted to write code like this, it would be kind of hard to do, uh, to, to you know, say you'd have to sit down with pencil and paper beforehand and figure out what all the algebra is. And then it would only work for that particular algebraic construct. Here we've defined a programming environment where the user puts the program in graphically. And I assure you this is a program because if we look at the construction protocol over here, it's actually a pretty, it's a pretty hefty construction protocol with a lot of stuff going on. And um, clearly we could make uh, more elaborate shapes as long as we understood what the rules were uh, which define those shapes. Um, and behind the scenes as well, there's this, you know, there's this tracking mechanism which is constantly remembering what all the values are and so we have algebraic definitions for what everything is. Now as complicated as all that was, let's show you that it's really not that complicated to then jump into the third dimension. There is this third dimension, three-dimensional view. And this is just an ex this is a GeoGebra 5 extension to what has existed in uh, for years in uh, GeoGebra 1 through 4. Uh, don't worry about what Graphics 2 is. That's if you wanted to have, let's say you wanted to have all of your sliders in a separate graphics panel from the main graphics panel. Uh, you could just simply define two different graphics panels. Or if you wanted to, let's say, have a set of input points which somehow generated graphics in the other panel, kind of like a, a graphic function, you could, you could do that as well. But this just means two, two, two independent two independently defined two-dimensional coordinate systems. But the 3D graphics panel, that's a completely new thing. So to get into that, let's, let's go into 3D graphics view. And we don't really need to see the algebra, uh, but let's leave it up just to see what happens. We could watch the construction protocol uh, grow as we build this, build, build this thing that I'm going to build. But um, we don't need that um, really uh, either. So I'm going to... Uh, you notice that all, all of the tools kind of change because now they're, they're three-dimensional versions. And in, so instead of move, just move, you, have, you still have that. But you also have um, move and rotate and so on. So everything's gotten a little bit trickier. Even entering points, as we'll see, is a little different. Let's enter one point, and I'll show you how that, that works. Um, we put a point here. Um, now we're in still point mode, so if we want to move it, we have to we have to kind of grab it and now I can move it if I drag it I'm actually dragging the Z coordinate you see the up and down is changing if I click again on it now I'm moving it in the XY plane um, so that's kind of the way that works let's actually um, define uh, what we want to do whereas before we defined that kind of tangent line by two points um, this time we're going to define a tangent plane by three points because you need three points in three dimensions to define that tangent. So here's one point. Here's another point. I don't care that it's on the plane. And I'll define another, a third point over here. And let's raise that point up. So we're going to make that point kind of higher up. It really doesn't matter exactly where they are uh, for now. Uh, the equivalent to defining a... Uh, let me see where it is. Yeah, here it is. The equivalent to defining a line between the two points has now become a plane through three points. So we are going to select that tool. Now we have to say which points define the plane. We want this one, A, B, and C. And there's our plane. So now let's say if we move one of the, one of the points that defines the plane, we see the plane react. 
okay? I can, I'm moving B in the X, Y space, but if I click again, now I'm moving it up and down. So here, here the plane is flat, right? If I move it down here, and let's say now adjust how near or far it is, I'm moving it that way. Maybe I want to move the plane kind of like this way. Ultimately, I want the circle to be over here, so I'm actually positioning it. So now we need to define the point, which is going to be the center of the circle. So let me put it here kind of close to the plane and also going back to move mode, raise it above the origin a bit. So there's our four points, the three that define the plane and this one here. Now we're going to do the same operations but in three dimensions to get the thing uh, defined. We're going to define a perpendicular line. This time the line is perpendicular to the plane. So we have to select the plane and the point that defines where the perpendicularity occurs. So now if we move this, we see, ah, this behaves like we want. That line is always perpendicular to the plane. Um, and as before, I think we had, a, we had it set so that, oh, I just noticed something. Uh, you don't have the same graphics tools in the 3D view for changing the line style. But I guess, I bet if you go into object properties, you can say, yeah, let's make it red, and let's make it thicker, and let's make it a dotted line. Okay, so there's our thicker red dotted line, um, which is the uh, the perpendicular. So as I move this uh, point D around, that's changing that. If I redefine the plane, then that's moving that around. Um, we also need to be concerned a little bit about what happens when when we when we make the circle. What happens if this uh, uh, two things we need to be concerned about. One is what happens if point D becomes coplanar here. All that means is the circle width goes to zero. But what happens if we accidentally stack A and B on top of one another? At that point, the plane gets undefined, and that's that's a little a little gnarlier. The program actually handles that by just kind of like not drawing things. But you have to kind of consider that kind of the kind of the edge cases of what might might occur and in a real environment you would you would have to have some kind of like fault mechanism if that occurred or some way of of dealing with it essentially as an as a kind of a graphic ex exception the last thing we want to do is we want to define a sphere that's is centered at d and is tangent oh yeah i skipped a step uh we have to define the intersecting point right there uh that goes between this line. I can actually do, click on it behind to get it. That line and that plane. So point E is the intersection between those two objects that I just selected. And finally, uh, we want to have a sphere with the center through a particular point. So here's the center and here's the tangent. So that's everything we need. If I Now I want to turn stuff off. I don't need to see the line I don't need to see the plane. I don't need to see point E. I do need to see the sphere, but I kind of don't want it to be this bright, obnoxious color. I'd like to pick a sort of a, like a more neutral, see-through kind of gray. Okay, there it is. And now, uh, I also don't really need to see the axes. Uh, that's kind of a lot of stuff we don't need. We didn't use the axes at all in this example. We could have had them off from the beginning. Uh, we also don't need to see this plane, um, the X, O, Y plane. So let me see if I can turn that off. No, that didn't turn off. Yeah, I, I would like to not see the uh, this plane here, but I can't. I don't know how to turn it off. Um, where's point C? Where did it go? Oh, point A. Point A disappeared. Huh, I, th I, th I think I may have turned off the wrong thing. In any case, now you can see we still have the real-time updating going on. I can move A, of course, from a two-dimensional two input device such as a mouse. I'm only varying two dimensions. From an actual uh, real-time device, you might be getting three-dimensional information in. But now we see all four of these points are unconstrained. They can move wherever we want, and this changes how that uh, circle gets drawn. So it's really kind of a, pr a powerful environment. Now, in this, in this case, I simply did a very simple demonstration involving a circle. But really, uh, you can come up with an arbitrary number of 
ways of displaying data. And um, as long as you are careful to follow the GeoGer approach of how things are built up from scratch, you know, how this, um, how this construction protocol is built up, um, it's going to be very consistent and it can, it can help you design some really, really sophisticated things. So I wanted to use that as a, as a way of illustrating the Brett Victor approach, even though I bet you anything, the fellow who designed this really, he may know of Brett Victor, but it's, it's not clear if he's specifically thinking in those terms, but it's, 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 it's the same type of, um, making the user be able to think in conceptual terms, a conceptual framework of, con of geometric constraints that defines a construction protocol, which is basically a program. Um, and uh, it's very, very sophisticated, very powerful. I've only scratched the surface of what GeoGebra can do. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Brett Victor. And if you want, watch each of those three uh, or possibly more um, video lectures of his that I've, um, I've included in this playlist. Thanks, that's all, and thanks for watching this uh, rather long, uh, somewhat ad-libbed video.